delivery of ads and i'm going to talk about two specific issues in guaranteed delivery of ads and they are about allocation and forecasting which we do in this paradigm of ad delivery right so the talk am i audible okay i think so i'll restart Can, am i audible now better okay okay Hi everyone, uh, could you please settle down? There's extra seating in hall number three, and this talk is live streamed over there. Uh, you just need to come in for Q and A. Thank you. Sorry, live stream's not up yet. So uh, yeah, settle in, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start once again. Right, I'm Aditya from Flipkart, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about guaranteed delivery of advertisements, and specifically two problems here: allocation and forecasting. Okay, so the talk is generally structured like this. I'm going to talk, introduce what is guaranteed delivery as opposed to what again, and uh, then the two problems I mentioned: allocation and forecasting. Right. So before I even get into guaranteed delivery and talk about it in detail, uh, what we need to know is what generally happens uh, in online advertising right so when we open a mobile phone or when we look at a web page what actually happens is an ad slot gets created every time an advertisement has to be shown and this ad slot sorry am i audible okay so this ad slot is then sent to a server and where advertisers bid to get this ad slot and the winner Th their advertisement gets shown this is what happens normally in performance based advertising right but guaranteed delivery turns the problem around a little bit and says okay can we can we do some can we add some more value here right one of the first things that we do is that give guarantees what kind of guarantees we can tell a brand uh, let's say volkswagen is launching a car and uh, we can tell them that hey i can give you a million views uh for the next one week right exactly million right at least a million rather right these kind of guarantees make their planning job much better and now they can even say that hey i want these guarantees on a niche segment of users like uh, they can say i want these guarantee i am launching a book in chennai uh, about chennai so can i target book lovers in chennai and then show them this many ads can i get 10000 ads from book lovers in chennai these kind of Uh, advertisers can demand these things and we can provide these guarantees so that is essentially what guarantee delivery does right what is in it for flipkart it is essentially that when you deliver such guarantees you can charge a premium for delivering guarantees right but to ensure that to ensure that we honor these guarantees what we actually do is we shake hands with the advertiser on a penalty right if we do not deliver a guarantee we do not honor and again a guarantee we are going to have an under delivery penalty right so on the downside so this is fine right but the bigger problem about guarantee delivery is not the penalty it's the fact that guarantee delivery can never completely be a system of its own in a sense we cannot assume that we can exactly know how many ad slots are going to come up in the next 2 months 3 months into the future in every single targeting segment so what happens is guaranteed delivery sits on top of the existing system and we just so it just adds to the complexity so the existing system has to be there where advertisers bid for the ad slots but then we sit on top and then say okay we can also provide guarantees right but we'll still do it because it it makes sense right so let me get into the various components of guaranteed delivery so what enable uh, guaranteed delivery first thing is audience segmentation right so let's look at this right we have flipkart uh, all the flipkart users here and then 
we can segment them on various ways i am representing this as a tree but it need not necessarily be a tree right so let's say i can divide them based on their gender and then i can partition them based on their location i can partition them based on which page they are on uh, what their interests are and so many other things where exactly on the page they are are they at the top of the page or at, are they at the bottom of the page are they on the app top of the app bottom of the app so there are so many ways by which we can divide our audience uh, the people who are on the uh, who are on flipkart properties uh, to show them advertisements right so this is called uh, audience targeting essentially this is how advertisers give us uh, information about what they want who who they want to reach they would say something like uh, uh, men in chennai are interested in books let's say right so that's just an example so now what we have is once imagine we can apply all such filters and then what we can do is we can get this bunch of uh, circles here which are disjoint audience segments uh by disjoint audience segments what i mean is that whenever a user sees an ad slot anywhere on the flipkart properties uh he would exactly fall into one of these circles that ad slot would exactly fall into one of the circles so each circle contains a bunch of ad slots and each circle is called an audience segment i am slightly abusing terminology here because just because an ad slot uh, actually opens up doesn't mean that it will be filled with an advertisement so what we are interested is actually users viewing those advertisements but Uh, let's assume that our uh, efficiency is 100% we can show the advertisement so essentially user views and ad slots are one and the same <laughs> right so the next thing is once we know what our disjoint ad slots are the what we can then do is we can divide we can predict we can given a day in the future we should be able to predict how many ad slots are going to open up in each of these audience segments so if you look at it so these are some random numbers which are there so essentially around, i would say that 2000 ad slots would open up in that particular audience segment uh, 15000 in the next and 120000 in the, in the third right so enabling this enabling how many of ad slots are going to open up in each of uh, these ad uh, segments uh, is called supply forecasting so essentially we we do have a supply of ad slots which are opening up and we need to forecast them well into the future the next component of uh, so once we have this forecast once we know what uh, we are going to show uh, how many ads are going to open up right uh, what we have is advertisers coming to us and saying hey i want to show this advertisement to these 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 various slots so what uh, the slots can be something like uh, uh, men in chennai right if if i take that then what happens is there are lots of uh, these segments which are about men in chennai not all of them but lots of them right so what the advertiser would want to show uh, is advertisements to men in chennai so then we will pick up all those audience segments and then connect them to the advertisement which is on the right so the squarish boxes which you see on the right are are actually the advertisements uh, sorry advertisements right so this problem of allowing advertisers to ask for uh some amount of demand essentially they can demand saying i want this many advertisements uh to be shown for this segment is called booking why is it a complex problem because an advert we cannot give guarantees on on an arbitrary number of uh advertisement views right we cannot show we can only we are restricted by the size of our audience so booking is a system which has a conversation with the advertiser automatically and it tells the advertiser that hey based on your targeting this is the best i can guarantee i cannot guarantee more than this so that system which figures out what is the best that you can do is called booking right once we have this bipartite graph of uh forecasts on one side uh, the supply nodes on one side audience segments and uh, on the right we have advertisements or the demand nodes right then what we need to do is we need to distribute saying hey uh, this topmost at uh, audience segment can be actually uh, it, we can show two different advertisements there the first first advertisement and the last one right so how in 
how do i show which advertisement do i show to if a user comes in the first or segment that is called uh, allocation right allocation is the problem of showing uh, figuring out which advertisement to show with what probability given a user comes uh, given a slot opens up in one of the audience segments right so i'll go slightly deeper into allocation and then i'll i'll talk about how we model allocation as a constraint optimization and the solve solution right so as i said earlier so allocation is nothing but adverti assigning advertisements to ad slots right so at i am browsing the app and there is an ad slot which opens up some advertisement has to come in right but this is not done at a user level it's rather done at an audience segment level so essentially what we do is instead of doing it at an user view or an ad slot we actually assign proportions to audience segment saying if somebody from this audience segment comes then assign x amount uh, x percentage to them right so for example if somebody from uh, the first audience segment comes then we would say okay 50% of the time show advertisement 1 and uh, 40% of the time show the last advertisement and the rest we couldn't book so we would go with a regular uh, bidding and uh, figuring out which who is the right advertiser to show right so this is uh, this is how the system works right so uh, the moment like i said uh, so the picking is random so we don't uh, necessarily decide which advertisement to show at what slot uh, uh, based on any criteria once we know the probabilities we just pick at random and then show the advertisement right this is fine but there are couple of objectives here uh, one is a of one is an explicit obvious objective which is we have signed up on a penalty if we do not show an advertisement so this penalty has to uh, we have to minimize this penalty we do not want to pay a penalty to the advertiser for not honoring the guarantees so that is the short term objective here and in the long term we also need to make sure that the audience segments are representative of the targeting okay the representative here is a loaded word but uh, okay what i mean by representativeness is that let's say there is a restaurant which opens in mg road and they would want to tell people in bangalore that hey we are a restaurant in mg road why don't you come and visit us right uh, but uh, they so they come come to us and say i want to show 10000 advertisements about uh, restaurant about our restaurant great so what we do is that we see that there are going to be 10000 men from electronic city uh, who are interested in let's say books uh which is going to open up on that particular day and then say hey let me allocate all of that to those people and not to anybody else in bangalore i'm honoring my guarantee i'm they just asked for people in bangalore i men in bangalore are people in bangalore men in electronic city are people in bangalore men in electronic city interested in books are also people in bangalore so i have honored the guarantee but the advertiser feels cheated right because the advertiser had an implicit assumption that it will go to all the people in bangalore and since the 10000 would get distributed across his targeting but it doesn't have, uh, so just minimizing the penalty doesn't ensure that the advertisements are the audiences are representative of the targeting so that's where the advertiser in the long term if we want a good relationship with the advertiser we also want to make sure that the audience is representative of the targeting the advertiser is mentioning okay so so now uh, let's pose this as a constraint optimization problem so uh, there is a minimization the minimization has two terms i'll i'll go through these terms one by one uh, so essentially what we have first is the forecasted supply uh, this is represented uh, as an s and it is indexed with uh, by i in this entire formulation right so there are various supply nodes or our audience segments and uh, we call them sis right so these are the various sis and the demand is represented as djs so we have j advertisements to be shown and each advertisement uh, sorry we have a bunch of advertisements they are indexed by j so these are the djs and and then we have a representative allocation by representative allocation uh, this is exactly what i mean in simpler terms let's say there are 
two groups of users there are 10 people in group a and there are 20 sorry 90 people in group b and i want to show 10 advertisements then i would show one one advertisement to group a and nine to group b so that is the representative allocation so that is the theta ij which we are talking about and xijs are our actual allocation what the algorithm comes up with saying hey this is the actual this is what i can do best right what we want to make sure is xijs to be as as close to theta ijs right so we want to be as representative as possible and if we are if we are fully representative then this entire term becomes zero and we have uh, our minimization works well right so that's that's the objective here and in this in the second part right this is our this is our long term objective and then we have our short term objective the short term objective is pretty straightforward we have an under delivery which we have signed up with every advertisement so every advertisement has an under delivery and uh, sorry under delivery is not something we have signed up for under delivery is essentially what we could not show so even though we gave a guarantee of let's say 100000 we could only show 90000 so we couldn't show 10000 those 10000 for that advertisement are the under delivery and what we have actually signed up for is the penalty we agreed on a penalty pj saying hey i'm going to pay this penalty per ad that i am unable to show so essentially the product of the penalty and the under delivery that is our short term objective we want to minimize this this is exactly what this is the amount that we have to pay out and we want we don't want that to be high right so these are uh, this is the minimization and it is sub subject to a bunch of constraints what are the constraints so the first constraint is that uh, let's move this uj to this side so essentially if this is what the advertiser has asked for and this is what we couldn't deliver right so the difference between them is should be at uh, should be uh, what we have actually delivered should be equal to or greater than that when would this be greater than that equal to is straightforward in the sense what we deliver and what we couldn't deliver together should add up to what the advertiser has asked for that's okay uh, the the reason why there is a greater than sign here is that uh, whenever we over deliver over delivery there is no penalty advertiser is happy we are also okay it's it doesn't hurt as much so if we over deliver then uj becomes zero and si xij can be greater than dj so so this is also uh, so that's the reason why there is an inequality there right and th the xijs can be thought of as probabilities uh, for example if you take the if we take the very first node then we can think of these xijs as something like uh, here uh, this node saying okay with 0.5 probability show this advertisement with 0.4 show this advertisement for a person in this node right so these cannot add up to more than one then so that's that's this constraint it's a commonsensical constraint and it's there and our xijs uh, for the very same reason cannot be negative and similarly our uh, uges we c cannot be negative so if we over deliver we still call the under delivery as zero and we use a greater than sign right so so again these are non negativity constraints pretty straightforward uh, uh, optimization problem yes please go ahead yes That's correct. Uh, should I repeat the question? So, okay. If so, uh, a good question. Uh, all I have to do is make sure that I minimize this term, right? It's not a theta ij is not a constraint. Th theta ij is just a is, is just a part of my minimization. In the constraint, all I need to make sure is see s the sij xij term, right? That's exactly that's the number of impressions that I have delivered, number of ads that I have delivered, should either be greater than this demand or that plus under delivery should be equal to this what the advertiser has asked for that's all the constraint is the constraint is in a much simpler form what you are saying the representativeness is taken care of by the minimization itself right it's it's not necessarily it, it's not written it's we don't need to write that down as a constraint it's not a constraint i agree it's not a constraint all i'm saying is that uh, 
even if you over deliver you are not actually targeting the targeted audience right you may be you may be, you may be showing a advertisement to people who are not really the ones where the uh, you know your advertiser uh, targeted so, so uh, agreed uh, uh, the the point is that when we uh, so this entire optimization right it will find the most optimal solution to this uh, to this setup right so if if we are doing that then we are going to lose the advertiser if we are going to do the, uh, show it in a particular way but we cannot do any better than that uh, for this equation uh, because this is this is the most optimal solution uh, okay if there are any further questions can we take that after the talk sure Uh, this is the short term objective this is my long term objective right so formulation is pretty straight forward uh, so what we have is uh, if you if you notice uh, other than uh, x i j's and u j's we know everything else uh, here beforehand right we have uh, we let's assume that we have forecasted and uh, let's assume uh, the booking system has given us the demand and uh, we know the representative allocation we know the penalty right so the only terms which we do not know are xijs and uj's so uh, what we do is we just append them into a variable vector and uh, th this is uh, this is like more like how we would solve it in python or something like that so essentially we need to rewrite this entire minimization problem in this form uh, separate the quadratic and linear terms and uh, and uh, all our constraints uh, are represented uh, in this form in a matrix form and uh, just use cvx opt or something like that to solve this solution is pretty straightforward cvx opt generally takes these p q g h matrices and then what this the solution object contains uh, z and from z we can get the xi xi j vector and uj vector so this the solution is pretty straightforward the the posing is the only only thing right so that's about the allocation part right the other part is forecasting so forecasting what i want to talk about is uh, a brief look at our data please yep good question so uh, this is a simplified version of the constraint optimization so what we can do is we can add a fairness objective here so instead of just sij we can say how fair how much importance should we give to representativeness for a given campaign right so let's say we can add uh, uh, an fj term here which is which let's call it the fairness term right si xi so just next to this si let's add an fj term this fj term is essentially how fair do you want to be to various kinds of advertisers so the way we compute it is essentially okay this is a large advertiser we don't want to lose this advertiser right we might be we might want to be more fair that that's one scenario we, you might want to compute it in a different way but essentially we just have to modify this and that will also become a known so it's just adding uh, a no, there are no addition of variables it's just uh, fairness is just an addition of one more term into the thing right it doesn't change our variables or the overall optimization that's that's correct so uh, if the uh, so uh, it's a good question uh, it's a problem of guaranteed delivery per se right so when we are going to give guarantees right what are we giving up we are giving up on matching the advertisements to the users we are not completely giving that up what we are actually doing is we are giving the control to the advertiser so the advertiser goes ahead and says i want to target exactly these people so they are giving a very niche targeting right so the importance of matching users to advertisements goes on to the targeting rather than ctr models or something like that which would give you the which would give you the right uh, match for a user to an advertisement right so uh, okay good question so the okay uh so the question was uh, how do we 
go about doing user segmentation right so for any given user we know a bunch of attributes right so these are the bunch of attributes if you apply whatever targeting which the advertiser needs and uh, put don't cares in the rest of them what we would end up with is a bunch of circles here right so wh what the advertiser needs so and then we go ahead and then say okay forecast for those circles and 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 the rest of the story so essentially any targeting will reduce to a subset of the circles right which are the uh, audience segments So, forecasting. Okay. So, firstly, uh, we uh, so we have these audience segments, these circles, right? Now, what we have is the number of user views which we have gotten at at, at a particular circle, uh, but a particular audience segment over time. So let's take daily aggregates and let's say 54, this is 54 days worth of data. And we see that hey, the, the views are fluctuating. Uh, sometimes some days we have a lot of views and some days we don't. And uh, in that particular audience segment, right? Now, uh, this is the basic time series of the data. And the next thing that we have is that we also know whether uh, all audience segments have a category information in them. In sense, we know in what category is this audience segment. So we also know whether there were any sale events, whether there were any discounts, what other things which might potentially affect the traffic in that particular audience segment. And uh, that, uh, that should also get captured. And the way we capture that is we have these uh, we have a time series and we also have these uh, blips uh, which are essentially telling us uh, that hey uh, this uh, this is the sale event happened here of this magnitude a sale event happened here of this magnitude we can add any number of variables this is just to show how the data is right so and what we need to do is we would have these orange bars in the future because we know what we have planned for in the future and we know these bars in the future but we do not know uh, how this curve is going to be or this uh, how how the views are going to change over the future so that is exactly what we need to predict given we know these orange orange bars in the past as well as the future right there are several ways of doing it uh, i am going to talk about one uh, one of them is our uh, least squares regression and then we c there are smoothing models which separate the these are not very great for modeling sale events, uh, the smoothing models. And there is something called Arima. It's an old technique, but uh, very useful and uh, very useful in our case. So I'll, I'll go into further detail, right? So Flipkart has millions, uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of uh, views in a given day, right? So w once we have all those ad slot views happening, uh, what uh, we have this entire hierarchy or grouping. So essentially, advertisers might want something like our running examples, like women in Bangalore, people in Chennai looking at books and things like that. And whatever the advertiser wants, we would need forecast there. We would need to be able to say, hey, this is the number of ad slots which are going to appear, right? So one simple thing is, if all the leaf level segments we have uh, are disjoint, then uh, knowing what would be okay i just saying men in uh, people in chennai looking at books or okay women in bangalore right uh, just looking at women in bangalore right is just nothing but figuring out what are all the leaf level nodes which uh, which have these two in their paths and then we just add them add their forecasts up so that's uh, straightforward in bottom up uh, but the problem with bottom up approaches is that if we have any nodes where there is not enough traffic the traffic is so low that uh, we cannot uh, uh, give reliable forecasts then we are going to have a problem so and then there is another approach where what we do is we just start top down we say okay let's forecast here and then see how get, it gets partitioned into uh, the into gender and then into location and everything but then top down is also slightly messy because uh, it assumes that there is a hierarchy even though i have drawn it as a tree this is not a hierarchy i can flip location first and then put gender later and it still works right so this is more about grouping so what we do is we use bottom up with some constraints so what we do is there can be millions 
of these nodes. Uh, because of the number of ways by which we target, we can quickly see that it is uh, the, the number of circles that we can end up with is millions. So one of the things that we do is that uh, we look at all those segments which have very little traffic and don't give guarantees on those segments. It doesn't make sense to give guarantees on the segments when there is very little traffic. And then we take only those segments where there are where there is enough traffic so that we can give guarantees. So that, that makes sure that our bottom-up approaches work and uh, we can just uh, aggregate it back up. No, th this is specifically for people who have logged in. And uh, people who have not logged in, it, there are ways to do it. One is... Uh, Yep. Uh, uh, if there are cookies in the ma in the machine, if the cookies are also cleared, I, I, I do not know. But uh, for mobile phones, it's straightforward because there is ad ID and you can just pick up the ad ID or the iOS ID and then start using it. So, yep. Right. So, uh, so what we want to do is we want to build these time uh, models which can forecast. But uh, if I have to use an Arima model, I will get into details of what an Arima model is. Uh, but if I have to do that, I need to. Something went wrong. Yeah, just one simple question. So does that mean that uh, uh, people in different locations could get different ads overall? That's correct. That's what you were showing me. Say so what if I'm a Bangalorean and I'm visiting Chennai for some other reason? So does that adding algorithm change again? Or so it depends when I say location, right? Mm -hmm. There are several locations. One is your base location. One is your current location. So based on what the advertiser is targeting, most advertisers target on base location. Okay. Right. Whether you, even if you are in the US and you are browsing a Flipkart app, if your base location is Bangalore, you will still be shown the advertisement. Right. Thank you. Right. So one of the things that we need to ensure uh, for uh, Arima models to work is that we have to make sure that they are stationary. Why? Uh, because generally, when we build ML models, we are assuming that uh, our features are independent. But uh, the way Arima models work is that uh, they take into account, uh, they, they uh, every data point is dependent. Uh, so we learn what is today's forecast based on yesterday's and the day before yesterday's. And they're clearly not independent. So if they are not independent, most of our base assumptions on which we build ML models fail. right? So we need to ensure that we can build models, we can do a regression. The AR in ARIMA stand for auto regression, that means regressing onto uh, your own data. So I'll just keep talking uh, while this thing comes up. So, uh, so, so to do that, to, to make ensure that it is stationary, uh, what do we have to do? Two things. One, uh, sorry, to ensure that they're independent, we cannot ensure that they're independent. So what we do is we ensure something which is a weaker constraint called stationarity. We ensure that the time series is stationary and then lot of these properties of independence hold on stationary data as well. So the stationarity becomes important and to make sure that our time series is stationary. So what do I mean by stationary? Uh, the mean of the time series over time. So if you take a window on the time series and then measure the mean value, the mean value should not change uh, so the the mean should stay constant wherever I measure uh, the mean. So that is called stationarity in mean. And then we also have the variance. The variance at any uh, segment of the time series should, should also remain constant. And uh, this is called stationarity in variance. Generally, stationarity in variance is achieved uh, through logarithmic transforms. And uh, there are some transforms. But uh, our data doesn't have first, uh, Variance, uh, sorry, uh, our data is stationary in variance. So, what we have a bigger problem is with stationarity in mean. What does station? So, how does stationarity, lack of stationarity in mean, look like? If a time series keeps going upwards, right? So, if I measure the mean, uh, if the time series is like this, it's going upwards, and if I measure the mean here, it's going to be some number. But if I measure the mean at the very end, it's going to be some other number. So, the mean is clearly changing, and it's not stationary. Right. 
okay so one of the ways of uh, dealing with uh, that's okay uh, so so uh, one quick way to deal with stationarity is that we can just take the time series and difference it by differencing what i mean is instead of looking at the time series itself what we would rather look at is the change over days so from yesterday to today it changed uh, i got 10% more views or 10 uh, uh, more views from day before yesterday to yesterday there were 10 more views sure did my laptop switch off so you start the yeah. oh okay thank you right so so this is my time series uh it's all nice to think of a straight line going upwards like this and then saying it's not stationary but in a real time series there is not a, it's not easy to say whether it's stationary or not right so we need to be able to say that hey whether the, is this time series stationary can i go ahead and start building my models so for that one simple so if we know that it is stationary then there is a simple trick all we have to do is see the change in time so if yt is today's uh, value and yt minus 1 was yesterday's value we rather use instead of using these as the time series we would rather use change over time uh, as our uh, as our time series so we would rather forecast the change over time and then we can always recompute uh, if we know the change over time we can always integrate and then get the actual value right so we sometimes we if the time series goes up like this exponentially then uh, then we might have to do double difference uh, double uh, we have to apply it again second order differencing and uh, so if i apply single difference so if y dash of t of this particular uh, uh, curve time series looks like this so for me this looks more like it's stationary in uh, my mean in the sense the mean is stable whereas here there is a slight upward movement here but uh, is it easy to uh, is this the right way to do it so we have slightly better tools one of them is called the autocorrelation function so what we do is we take the time series we take a time the same time series with a lag right with a lag of 1 with a lag of 2 with a lag of 3 with a lag of 4 and so on and so forth and then we see how correlated are the time series across lags right so this is the original series and this is the autocorrelation the correlation of the time series with itself across lags and we see that this doesn't fall fast it falls very gently to zero so this is a indication that the time series is non stationary this is a rule of thumb indication so uh, to check this if we take the different series you see that the auto correlation falls very fast below zero so this is this is a clear sign that hey we have reached stationarity but then we have as i said there are millions of circles even if we eliminate the smaller ones we still have hundreds of thousands of circles uh, so we cannot keep looking at these plots and then say hey this series needs to be different this series doesn't need to be different and they change every day so we cannot do this so in practice what we do is there are unit root tests what is unit root tests do is that the test for uh, the whether, uh, whether there is a stationarity or not and uh, one of the tests is called augmented dicky fuller test this is implemented in most packages we just use that and a negative value here indicates that our series is stationary actually a, a augmented dicky fuller test actually test for non stationarity so uh, from there we can figure out whether it is stationary or not so yeah so so there is also differencing which is seasonal in nature so if if you have seasonal data let's say every 12 months you uh, 
you have more than a year's worth of data and then what you do is you difference this october's value from last october's value right so th th that's called seasonal differencing like how we did normal differencing we also can do seasonal differencing and that removes the seasonality out right so this is uh, forecasting with arima there are arima is actually a combination of several models uh, the i stands for the differencing that we did uh, it's called uh, integrated uh, so it's it's just that we'll have to do the opposite once we have done with dif once we are done with differencing so uh, that's i and uh, the ar and ma are actually two different models uh, the first one the arp model essentially says that uh, the value of a time series at time t depends on the values of the time series at the last p instances right so we awaited uh, addition of them plus an unforecastable error term so this is this is a simple auto regression model uh, essentially this looks like a regression but just that these are these are values which are directly from uh, which are the past values of this yt right so in a different series it will be y dash of t equal to uh, this where this is y dash of t minus 1 y dash of t minus 2 and so on and so forth the ma model is slightly more complex it's called the moving average model what we essentially do is we assume that there is a model uh, and then we uh, we we assume that there is a model and then compute the errors of the model and once we have the errors computed then we compute the yt and then based on the errors we get new models new thetas uh, like a regular regression but once we get the new thetas again we get a new set of errors and uh, it's it's a complex model to build and uh, a nonlinear model but we do have uh, algorithms and uh, implementations in place which can solve these uh, ma models so essentially an arima model is nothing but a combination of these two so these constant terms are uh, are the c and then we have these arima terms uh, sorry ar terms ma terms and an e terms now what happened to the sale events right so sale events are pretty straightforward all we have to do is let's say we are looking at the past uh, uh four days or something like that with p right so what we do is we then we then take the last four days what was the say what were the sale events if there was no sale event we just set it to zero and we add four more variables to this and then solve this right uh, sale events discounts everything it's just adding more uh, terms uh, like this uh, to this particular uh, regression and then figuring out yt so this is what arima with sale events does but this is good but how do we know sorry please go ahead there is a hi uh, for the sale events as you mentioned if if it's a regular series it's okay but when you uh, when you are uh, applying it on a different series right how do you take uh, i mean how do you take the sale events into account say the sale event is or probably it is today yes. so when you are differencing the values like today minus yesterday so but yesterday there was no sale event right so how do you take that into account so you don't have to difference the sale events just use the sale events directly right that. so take it on one side so let's say one simple uh, way to take it always on the uh, if if it is difference take it on the right side or yt rather than yt minus 1 something like that you you assume one and you go ahead with that right it is just a signal which just says okay uh, uh, how much this value is dependent on the sale events but the sale events would affect the stationarity right sale events would uh, no they don't affect the actual time series right they only affect they only add to uh, they only add an additional component to that so uh, okay uh, can we can we take this uh, offline yeah, sure, sure, sure. uh, let's discuss this okay uh, okay quickly to conclude two more slides right so so this is all fine but we need to know the right values of p q and uh, d d we already know we can sorry uh, we can use uh, uh, adf uh, test to figure out the d value but how do we figure out the p q, p and q values and uh, that we generally what we do is we start with p0 q0 this is uh, if on a non different series this is just uh, assuming that we cannot predict it's just purely random and on a different series uh, this is uh, what we have is a uh, this is called a random walk model essentially uh, yt is dependent on yt minus 1 plus some error so this is a random walk model and we we then uh, that's p0 q0 once we have 
uh, and then we go ahead and compute a metric. What metric? Uh, I'll introduce a metric in the next slide. Uh, one of the things which we use is called MAP, ma mean absolute percentage error. And I'll, I'll talk about that. And so we, we, we choose some metric, and then we compute the metric here. And then we, we pick its neighbors, and go ahead, see what is the winner, and then pick its neighbors, and so on and so forth, till we found uh, the optimal point. Right. So this is this is what happens in this is what we do in practice to uh, to figure out the right values of p and q, and lots of these metrics not uh, map, but there are some metrics which also take into account the size of p and q because you don't want to build a, a model with lots of variables. You want to reduce that, and uh, and that's uh, so there are things like uh, Akai Kai information criterion and. Uh, BIC Bayesian information criteria, which can, which do take a uh, size of P and Q into the into account. Thank you. So, so how does the output look like? So, let's say I stop uh, seven days before 54. That is uh, on the 47th day. This is where I stop, uh, and I learn the model there. And this is how the forecast look like, right? Using uh, the, the the optimal PD and Q values which I found for this particular time series for 3, 1, and Q one. So this is what the forecast look like. So in reality, uh, and the mean absolute percentage error, essentially what we do is we take the forecast and we take the actual value and then see what percent is it off from the actual value. And then uh, we compute a mean of those. Right. So that's the metric which is called MAP. And uh, in reality, what we do is we cannot take the absolute forecast. Rather, what we do is because we have to give guarantees, we take the forecast in a certain confidence interval. And since confidence interval says that, OK, 80% of the time, where does this forecast lie? right? So the, uh, it, generally, it, it should be lying here, but that's the expected value. But 80% of the time, it lies within a window. So what I'm looking at is the lower bounds of the window. The upper bounds are not useful in guaranteed delivery. So the lower bounds of the window is what I'm taking at, uh, looking at and providing guarantees on. Right. This is my last slide. And uh, OK. Uh, this is a very simple uh, uh, Python implementation of an ARIMA model with uh, time series sale events and future sale events. And this is how you do it, just for reference. So uh, to conclude, uh, uh, so we need guaranteed delivery for better quality of service, better revenue. And uh, for that, we need to make sure that these two components work well. And there are other components which I'm not talking about, but uh, allocation uh, has to deliver ads by honoring explicit and implicit guarantees. And forecasting, we have to do that uh, to set the base for GD in the sense of allocation and every other algorithm depends on these forecasts, right? We have to forecast two to three months into the future. That's about it. Uh, questions, please? So, hmm. Or do I have any more time for questions? Yes. We have four more minutes. Four more minutes? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, in the segmentation part, so like uh, if there is a, like a city, there is the cardinality, let's say it's 500. For the segments, the cardinality is let's say 100. And something else has the cardinality 100. So pretty soon it will, the overall segments will be like 500 into 100 into 100. Pretty soon it will explode very fast, right? That's correct. So like how do you control that uh, number of segments? Or like you are using any specific strategy to control this number of segments or? No, by. Just a second. Yeah. Sure. Uh, there's an announcement, please. Quick and quick announcement, guys. So there's feedback forms. Please make sure you collect them from the volunteers. Uh, if the hall is overflowing, there's a balcony, apparently, which for the auditorium one, sorry, for the, yeah. So there's a balcony at auditorium one, uh, and the rest will announce at the next uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Aditya. Go on. Yep. That's a good question. So what actually happens is that uh, we'll have Millions, not not even millions, even more, I right? I think. Yep, so. it does. But the audience in each of those disjoint segments drops to zero. So okay. ninety-nine point nine percent of our segments don't have any audience views. Forecastable number. Oh. So our number of views per day would be one zero five something like that, which would be so low that we would want we don't we don't want to give guarantees there. So you the that constraint optimization part. Exactly. We drop them off. And how do we drop? Let's say we take only 99% of our traffic. That will be only in less than 1% of our uh, segments. Okay. Right? Okay. So that's a good strategy. 99% of our traffic or 99.5% of our traffic is a good strategy to 
make sure that these segments are very few. Ma Hi. One Sorry. Question. The segments itself are not constant over a period of time. So for forecasting, do you pre-compute what is the uh, like numbers for each segment? Uh, do you have a, uh, like a semi-aggregated kind of data? Then you no, we compute it for each day for each item. So right? then the segment uh, itself. Yes, if the segments change, whenever the change comes, whenever there's a new store opens, or uh, a new category opens in Flipkart, then we will start forecasting for that as well. Back computer. Yep, e we will not have data. Initially, it will not be in guaranteed delivery, but slowly it will enter guaranteed delivery once we have enough data. Okay. So, one question. So, you, you are saying you are forecasting using Arima. Then you are trying to add uh, the sales events or promotions that you are going to have. So, are you trying to build an entire equation that you are going to solve or take this Arima forecast as one of the uh, input uh, parameters and then build uh, multiple models on it? Uh, most Arima implementations allow us to give uh, additional variables uh, on which we would generally regress, right? Okay. So they are called exogenous variables. And what we can do is instead of just giving the original time series, we can also give exogenous variables. So they will be added as a part of the equation. Okay. So okay. that's like the Arimax. Arimax, exactly. That's what it's called. Okay. okay. So whenever you are on a mob uh, mobile app, right so the advertisement is not there beforehand right just after you op open the app and you are scrolling down what happens is a slot gets created and within like 10 to 20 milliseconds an ad comes up there so it's something which we don't perceive but what actually in reality happens is an ad slot opens up and tells the server that hey there is a slot here show an ad and the server comes back and says okay this is the ad Empty slot. exactly uh, not just new sign in in any uh, anybody any page right you are browsing any page any ad let's say somebody is now on this page okay, okay. as the page is loading fine, fine. Uh, there is this so mild lag start opening up because of something freeing up no no use uh, because of usage yep. Uh, yep. i have one question uh, uh, so for this uh, audience targeting right, for the segmentation so the base data which you use have you created a single customer view something like that to actually create these uh, segments uh, how do you come up with these uh, segments uh, which you use for audience targeting? So there are various segments. Uh, we have been doing advertising for quite some time. So th we know what segments uh, are, u are of interest to the advertisers. Right? So the advertisers generally tell us what segments they are interested in. That kind of tells us, uh, gives us a clue on what are those various cuts. Right? And then based on that, and that's one. The other thing is we we'll look at the traffic in each one of them and then determine, hey, there is enough traffic here that we can give guarantees. If th there is not enough traffic, then we say, okay, there is no traffic. We cannot give guarantees. G let's go into the bidding world and then let the advertisers bid and win those slots if required. So you kind of know the uh, segments before itself and then you try to get the data. And uh, we know the segment cuts. Uh, right, and uh, we know what data in the past was there in each of these things, right? Based on the volume of data in the past, we say which are the ones where we can give reliable guarantees, and which are the ones we cannot, and then we drop the ones where we cannot. So, when you're relying on the past data, look, one thing I ask is like, so like, is the, uh, at any point of time, different segments are and different ads are competing for different segments. Isn't the performance of the ad is dependent on the time seasonality? Say, for example, like you know, winter season, whatever offer sale is going on. So yes. at that time, some particular ads were performing good. That's but correct. then, like you know, the time moved on, the entire history might be redundant. So how do you handle this variation with respect? Good thing. So what I was talking about is a model called Arima. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of additions to this. Yeah. One of them so is uh, yeah. like if somebody if was if I understand right. Arima is for the sales forecasting, not exactly. really for the mapping part. That's correct. Yeah. So the mapping doesn't change over time, right? Yeah. Whether whatever is the seasonality, the volume of traffic in each of these might change, but the mm. mapping, the what segments we have is, is let's assume they are fixed. Yeah. What Arima does is there are seasonal variants of Arima, mm -hmm. uh, which can take extra sales events mm. also into account. So they are called uh, Sari Max, right? Seasonal mm -hmm. Arima with exogenous variables, right? So essentially, it's just Arima with a little complexity. But uh, that's how they are handled. And seasonal seas seasonal Arima models actually take seasonal patterns into account. Mm -hmm. Seasonal uh, they even the differencing that they do to get stationarity is seasonal in nature, and uh, that's how they they work.
if you are taking booking strategy, whatever the current booking, use only those two trade segments. The segments keep changing over a period of time, like every every few days. No, that's something which we cannot do. We because booking system needs the forecast to be able to book, right? So the segments have to be before booking. So then you create all all the possible. Exactly, we have to deal with all possible segments, truncate them, but. still uh, still that number on the uh, number of audience segments is uh, large so, you know so that's why ideally comes from third party side right? so they irrespective of what segments you have or not they expansion their criteria segments is what we in what you might be creating in terms right so uh, the advertiser data you are talking about am i out of time no now it's uh, completely up to you and if okay i can yeah i yeah you should give yourself all the formality thank you that makes life much easier <laughs> What's the next talk in Madhya Pradesh? You know that. Yeah. I think you need to have Zainab. Uh, you need run extra runners at call one, right? Yeah.